Hi, my name is Tracy Burr. I'm an ambassador for Animal Protection of New Mexico's plant-based eating program. We've teamed up with Factory Farming Awareness Coalition, a nonprofit that talks to people about where our food comes from and the impacts of our food choices. Today, I'll be giving FFAC's presentation about the realities of factory farming. In today's video, I'm going to cover factory farming basics and standard practices. How many of you sang Old McDonald when you were kids? Pretty much everyone, right? When we walk into a grocery store and look around at the images on food, we see pictures like this one that make it seem like Old McDonald's farming methods are still being used today. There's all the rolling green hills and happy cows, but as I'm here to talk about, that's not what farming is actually like anymore. Rather than Old McDonald, this is what we have today. Factory farming is technically known as Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations, or CAFOs. It's the practice of keeping thousands of animals in confinement, often for their whole lives. This is done to produce the most product for the most profit. Does anyone want to guess how many animals are bred and killed for food every year in the U.S.? Every year in the U.S. alone, more than 10 billion land animals are raised and killed for meat, eggs, and milk. There are more farmed animals in the U.S. alone than there are people on the entire planet. To put it into perspective, that's 285 animals killed every second for food. So of those 10 billion animals raised in the U.S., does anyone want to guess what percentage of them are raised on factory farms? 99% of all animals raised in the U.S. are raised on factory farms. So pretty much any meat you see in a restaurant or at the supermarket is coming from a factory farm. So what is life like for these many, many animals? I'm going to give a few examples of how individual animals are treated in the factory farm system. We're going to start with chickens, specifically layer hens. This is Laverne. Laverne is a layer chicken, which means that she was bred to lay as many eggs as possible. Layer hens like Laverne are bred to lay more than 300 eggs per year. This is an enormous strain on her body. A hundred years ago, layer hens produced only about half as many eggs, and the original chickens, like the red and gray jungle fowls, laid only 10 to 15 eggs per year. Laverne spent the first year of her life on a factory farm. I'm going to tell you what her life was like before she was rescued. Shortly after she was born, Laverne had the tip of her beak cut off with, without anesthetic. This process is called debeaking. In normal conditions, chickens develop a hierarchy. You've probably heard of a pecking order. But in confinement, chickens can't maintain their normal social order. Many birds get so stressed out that they peck at or even cannibalize the other birds. So to prevent chickens from attacking each other, the sharp parts of their beaks are cut off without any sort of pain relief. This is extremely painful for the chicks, and many of them die because they're not able to eat afterwards. Here we'll see a video of the machine that debeaks the chickens. Don't worry, it's not bloody at all. I just want to give you a glimpse into industrialized animal farming. This machine uses a laser to remove part of the chick's beaks. Chicks are placed head first into this rotating machine. Bird's beaks are filled with nerve endings. This procedure can cause both acute and chronic pain.
This is standard practice on all egg farms, but it's a very far cry from what most of us imagine when we think about where our food is coming from. As soon as Laverne got big enough, she was put into a battery cage, which is what you see here. She was crammed into a cage with seven other chickens so small that she literally couldn't move. She couldn't even turn around. She had less space than a single sheet of paper. Her body and wings were pressed up against the other chickens and against the bars of the cage, and she was standing on top of wire mesh. And she had to live like this, never leaving this cage for an entire year. She was kept in a barn with 50,000 other chickens, all in cages stacked row upon row. After just a year or two, chickens' bodies give out from the stress of these unnatural conditions. At this point, they produce fewer eggs, so they're not as valuable. So they're sent to a slaughterhouse to become dog food or other extremely low-grade chicken products. You might wonder, what happened to Laverne's brothers? What happens to the male chicks? They obviously don't lay eggs, only females lay eggs, and they don't get big enough to be valuable for meat. So all male layer chicks, more than 250 million per year, are dumped into grinders and ground up alive. This is one shocking byproduct of the egg industry that not many people are aware of. Now let's have a cuteness interlude. I know this is a lot of disturbing information and I appreciate that you're willing to learn. I wanna give you a moment to take a breath and process the information. Next, I'll talk about broiler chickens, the chickens raised for meat. These are Davies, Miles, and Mulligan, chickens raised for meat who were rescued when their crate fell off of a transport truck. Broiler chickens have been bred to grow bigger than ever before, more quickly than ever before. They now grow twice as big as they used to in just half the time. Here you see the results of a study conducted at the University of Alberta that compared chicken breeds genetics from 1957, 1978, and 2005. The three groups of chickens were raised in identical conditions and given the same feed for 56 days. The modern breed was 400% larger than the 1957 chicken. It doesn't even look like the same kind of bird, does it? Because chickens now grow so quickly, they are now fully grown and ready to be slaughtered at only six weeks old. They haven't even hit puberty yet. That's like if we raised human children to weigh 600 pounds by the time they're 12 years old. As you can imagine, this unnaturally fast growth places a lot of stress on chickens' bodies, both inside and out. Chickens didn't evolve to grow that big, let alone that quickly. There's a 90% chance that these chickens will not even be able to walk normally because their legs simply can't support all of that weight. If they hadn't been rescued, they would have been sent to slaughter. First, they would be loaded into crates on trucks. According to expected industry rates, a worker should crate 30 birds every minute. So he grabs several birds at once by the legs and throws them into these crates that we see here. As a result of this rough handling and the stresses of transport, a third of these chickens will have freshly broken bones by the time they arrive at the slaughterhouse. In the U.S., one of the few federal laws to protect farm animals is the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. This states that animals must be unconscious prior to slaughter to ensure a quick and relatively painless death. But this law does not apply to chickens or turkeys, the two most commonly slaughtered animals in this country. They receive no legal protections as to how they're slaughtered. So once the chickens arrive at the slaughterhouse, they're hung up by their legs in shackles on a moving conveyor belt system. Remember that their legs are often broken by this point. Then they're dragged through an electrified water bath to stun them. The industry says the electrified water bath makes them unconscious, but scientists state that the voltage used is high enough to paralyze the chickens, but not high enough to make them unconscious. So they're paralyzed but conscious when they have their throats slit. 
But what about all the products you see with special labels like organic or free range? I'm going to explain all of those, starting with cage free. This is a picture of a cage free, free range egg farm. It's true, these hens are, aren't in cages, but this isn't exactly what we imagine when we see cage free or free range and see those happy looking chickens on the cover of the carton. Chickens in cage free facilities still live in industrial sheds by the tens of thousands which contributes to all of the same animal welfare and environmental problems. What about free range? On the left, we see a photo of the wording on a carton of eggs from Judy's, an organic free range egg brand. It says, these hens are raised in wide open spaces in Sonoma Valley where they are free to roam, scratch, and play. Well, on the right, you can see an aerial photo of what Judy's eggs actually looks like. It's an industrial shed with tens of thousands of chickens, not a single one setting foot outside. Judy's actually settled a lawsuit for misleading consumers with the wording on their packaging, but they just changed the wording, not the conditions. They're still certified organic and cage-free. They sell their eggs under several different brand names and are a supplier for Whole Foods 365 brand and Organic Valley. So even very respected free-range brands are still sourcing their products from factory farms. What about organic? Organic says very little about animal treatment. It's mostly related to consumer health. The animals are not given hormones, antibiotics, or GMO or pesticide-laden feed. Organic does say that chickens are given access to the outdoors with the same meaningless language as the free range requirement. Organic chickens can also still be debeaked. Let's take a breather. Now I'm going to move on to dairy. This is Honey the cow, who was used to produce milk for human consumption for many years before she was rescued. What do you think has to happen to a cow in order for them to produce milk? Cows are not magical milk machines. Like all mammals, they have to have a baby in order to produce milk. Humans are the only species that consume milk after we're no longer babies. Usually only babies drink milk. We're also the only species that regularly drinks a different species milk. Would you ever drink dog milk? Why not? Do you think if the dog milk industry spent hundreds of millions of dollars on advertising like the cow milk industry does, you would still think it's weird? In order for humans to get large amounts of milk from honey, she had to first be impregnated. This was done via forcible artificial insemination. There's a real concern about exploiting these female animals for their reproductive systems. Next, we'll see an undercover video of what happens to the calves after they're born.
After her calf was taken away from her, Honey was hooked up to a machine three times a day that took the milk intended for her calf. After 10 to 12 months of being milked, she was again artificially impregnated. Her calf was again taken from her, and she was again milked three times a day. This happened to her year after year until she could no longer produce a valuable amount of milk. Luckily, at that point, Honey was rescued. But most dairy cows are sent to slaughter to become either hamburger meat or dog food. Time for a cuteness interlude. How many of you or your families buy almond or soy milk at home? The good news is that if you found that video sad, there are so many plant-based milks in the market nowadays. Almond, soy, coconut, rice, cashew, hemp, oat. That milk is one of the easiest products to replace. We can leave the milk for the baby cows and drink plant-based instead. Now we're gonna talk about pigs. We'll start off with a cute video of a mama pig who was rescued for a fact, from a factory farm where she was used to breed piglets raised for pork. Unfortunately, most mama pigs, or sows, never get to experience the freedom she just did. They spend their entire lives either pregnant or nursing, confined in crates so small that they cannot even turn around. A spokesperson for the National Pork Producers Council said, So our pigs can't turn around for the two and a half years they're having piglets. I don't know who asked this sow if she wanted to turn around. Do you have to talk to your dog or cat to know how they're feeling? How do you think this pig feels compared to the pig we saw in the video? After her piglets are born, they'll have their tails, the sharp parts of their teeth, and their testicles cut off without any type of pain relief. A lot of people ask, isn't this animal cruelty? Why doesn't the, the government do something? The sad reality is that farm animals have virtually no legal protections. Every state has laws against animal cruelty, but almost every state also has what's called a common farming practice exemption. This states that if a practice is commonly done on a factory farm, it's automatically legal. So factory farms get to decide for themselves whether or not a practice is cruel. Cutting off a puppy's tail without an aesthetic or keeping a pregnant dog, lo dog locked in a closet for 16 weeks? Felony animal cruelty. Cutting off a piglet's tail without an aesthetic? Automatically legal because it's common practice on factory farms. To make matters even worse, agribusiness has been trying to pass ag-gag laws that make it a felony for people to take photos or videos without permission at food production facilities. So they're literally trying to make it a crime for us to see where our food is coming from. <sighs> we need a break. Now we're going to talk about fish. But before we do, I just want to revisit the numbers of animals killed each year. Remember, that 10 billion figure didn't include fish. If we include the animals from the ocean, this number grows to about 56 billion. This includes about 43 billion shellfish and nearly 4 billion finned fish. Total, that's around 1,500 animals per second. And that number still doesn't include bycatch, which are all the animals caught in the ocean and killed by accident. So let's talk about fish, which is an industry that gets very little attention. There are two different types of fishing, wild-caught and farmed. We'll talk about both, starting with wild-caught. The big problem with wild-caught fishing is that we're taking so many fish out of the ocean every year that we're not leaving enough to repopulate. In this next video, you'll see what I mean. 
This is what's called a super trawler. It's a giant industrial ship that has nets up to a mile long that it uses to reel in everything in its path. On the top, those little red blobs are people to give you an idea of the scale. There are ships like this operating all day, every day, in international waters all around the world. We're pulling as many fish as we possibly can out of the ocean so that every year there are fewer and fewer fish left in the ocean. It's also killing other species. Anything that lives in the ocean can be caught and killed in those nets, what's known as bycatch. This includes sharks, dolphins, whales, sea turtles. The fishing industry is also the single largest source of ocean plastic pollution. We hear a lot about not using straws or plastic bags, which is good to do, but really the best thing you can do to help keep plastic out of the ocean is to not support the fishing industry. Because we're so rapidly destroying the ocean's fish populations, we're turning to aquaculture or fish farming. Half of all fish now come from fish farms. These are basically factory farms in the water with all the same problems. Fish farms house millions of fish in giant netted pens in rivers or oceans in such confined conditions that the fish are often literally swimming on top of each other. Having so many animals in close proximity results in tremendous concentrations of manure, which is washed directly into the local river or ocean ecosystem. This causes dead zones, where there's not enough oxygen in the water to sustain life. Intensive confinement also leads to disease, so fish are fed antibiotics in their feed, which again washes out into surrounding aquatic ecosystems.